Hello Health 230 students, this is Brian Clark and today I will be going over chapter number one. I think it would be a good idea to know these key terms before reading chapter number one as well as listening to this lecture. And before we dig into the material, uh, I want to make sure that everyone knows that you can download a more comprehensive version of this PowerPoint from the Blackboard site. Uh, I will be going over the material that I, that I find to be most important due to time limitations. All right, on the first page of chapter number one, you're going to see some information on there about food choice. Uh, that's giving you information about why people eat the foods that they eat, and largely we eat the food that we eat because of socialization. That simply means that you have a tendency to eat like your mother and father did, or your brothers and sisters, or more generally speaking, you have a tendency to eat like those people that you, that you grew, grew up around. Uh, second on the list there, food availability, and um, yes, we certainly do make food choice based on food availability, and um, there is inherent risk that goes along with that. When you look at food availability throughout the entire history of human evolution, uh, there has been a very distinct seasonality to that food availability. There's been very limited meat in humans' diets, but now uh, food availability is dramatically different in that food is very available to us. We can have meat in our diet each and every day. Uh, some people just about have meat in their diet every meal. Um, also, when you look at the availability of simple sugars, uh, simple sugars are very available now, whereas um, in very short um, uh, in a very short time in the past, it was not because a person could only get those simple sugars uh, during the summer or um, in late spring when when certain fruits were in season. And um, it's worth pointing that out because we have a tendency to to have a, a taste or uh, to have a palate for things like meat and simple sugars because yes they they do provide our body with energy and they do provide our body with amino acids and nutrients that we need but we, we don't need those on a daily basis uh, even though um, our our ancestors were seeking those out on on a regular as often as they possibly could, but the food just was not as as available then as it is now. Uh, continuing on, uh, some people eat because of associate associations, whether they be positive or negative. Um, a lot of people people eat because of emotional comfort, but regardless of what factors or variables determine food choice. Uh, it is our responsibility to be able to convey information about eating a balanced diet. <clears throat> um, I want you knowing what an essential nutrient is. An essential nutrient is any one in the body, any nutrient um, that the body cannot make or cannot make in sufficient quantities to meet the needs of the body. I want you knowing the six nutrient classes that being are those being water, carbohydrates, lipid, pr lipids, proteins, vitamins, and minerals. And it's also important to note that uh, many of the foods that we eat have uh, have non-nutrient components, things like preservatives, food coloring, and such. And um, oftentimes there is risk that comes along with those. Uh, those non-nutrient components. Continuing with the nutrients, I want you knowing that carbohydrate, fat, and protein, those are considered to be macronutrients because of those those are the the nutrients that we are getting in large amounts on a daily basis. For every one gram of carbohydrate that we eat, that one gram is going to provide four kilocalories of energy to the body. Uh, protein is also going to provide four kilocalories to the body. However, fat is going to provide over twice as much energy as that of carbohydrate and protein. So, such that when we ingest one gram of fat, we are ingesting nine kilocalories, and that is fairly significant. 
The micronutrients are vitamins and minerals. Vitamins are essential nutrients that allow the body to obtain energy from carbohydrate, fat, and protein. Minerals, those are, are inorganic, and those are essential nutrients that are found in the bones, teeth, muscles, and bodily fluids. <clears throat> and we, we have to have those. Um, people oftentimes don't understand how important it is to make sure that mineral intake is is appropriate. Um, if, for example, if we don't get enough um, calcium and potassium, muscular contraction does not occur properly. When you consider that the heart is a muscle, uh, the, the, you can understand very quickly that those minerals are very important. Uh, this next concept is one that I want you to understand more on a conceptual basis. I want you on a conceptual level to understand that a calorie is simply a unit of measure. It's a method by which we quantify the amount of energy in food as well as quantify the amount of energy that we expend when we're doing activity. Um, whether it be us doing physical activity or whether it be uh, the body doing its normal physiological processes. <clears throat> And when you understand information about calories, you will very quickly be able to understand information about energy density. Uh, on the left-hand side, in figure 1-2 uh, in your text, you're going to see a relatively low calorie breakfast that is composed primarily of carbohydrate and proteins. Uh, each one gram of that carbohydrate and protein will provide the body with four kilocalories. And um, you can see you're going to get a fairly significant amount of food there on the left. And all of that only weighs 450 grams. And that 450 gram breakfast is going to provide the body with 500 kilocalories, uh, which yields a, or an, which yields a nutrient density of 1.1 kilocalories per gram. On the right-hand side, you see uh, you know, sig significantly less food. You only have two donuts, but those two donuts are primarily fat because they have been deep fried in fat. And by the way, all donuts are deep fried in fat. <laughs> um, it's 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 how a donut is made, and because it is fried. Uh, as, I, as I said, it is almost 100% fat. Uh, we only have 144 grams there on the right-hand side, but um, that is also going to provide the body with 500, kilo, uh, 500 calories, uh, <clears throat> which pr provides a, um, an energy density of 3.5 kilocalories per gram. So you can see how when you eat a high-fat meal that the energy energy density is very high and we have to be really careful about eating foods that are high in energy density because quickly we can um, we can ingest more energy than we need. Uh, I want you to look very closely at this information uh, on the science of nutrition because it gives you some information on how nutrition research is performed and generally speaking the one thing that is most important that you understand is that nutrition is a hard science we understand very well how the body processes certain nutrients and it's it's the same from one person to the next there's there's very little variability from one person to another uh, on how nutrients are used and how calories or energy is used within the body. So um, you know, when you hear someone say, uh, you know, "Well, I'm, you know, I, I don't eat a whole lot, but um, you know, I, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's my it's my metabolism," or, or starts making all these crazy excuses as to why they may be overweight or wh why their health is or is not affected by their diet. Um, it, it's just not true. Um, that old adage, "You are what you eat." Uh, does have a lot of value, and um, you know, we understand very clearly what's going to happen if you eat, for example, uh, you know, candy bars and soda on a daily basis, or you know, if, if a person's eating uh, a dozen eggs a day. We we know what the consequences are going to be because we understand the basic science of nutrition. So look over that information 
that you see in figure 1-3 and 1-4 and understand what epide epidemiological studies are versus experimental studies that are performed in the lab. And um, in particular, what I want you understanding is that for information to make its way into a textbook, there's a very high level or a high burden of proof. And um, uh, so oftentimes we don't see people expecting that high burden of proof before they apply information to their diets. But considering that most of you all are planning on being clinicians, uh, you, need, you need to also adopt that high burden of proof. Uh, in the section on dietary reference intakes, and by the way, DRI does, st does stand for dietary reference intake and not daily recommended intake. I hear that all the time, and it's just not right. Um, the dietary reference intakes are estimated average requirement, and that one is exactly what it sounds like. Um, RDA, recommended daily allowances, and it is worth reading the, the information in particular looking at the information in figure 1-5 on RDAs so that you understand uh, what an RDA is and that RDAs do allow for um, just about the entire population to have an adequate amount of a given nutrient. Uh, know what ad adequate intakes are, tolerable upper intake level, that one's also exactly what it sounds like, estimated energy requirement, and accepted macronutrient distribution ranges. So look over that information. Uh, I do want to point this out. This is figure 1-6. And in particular, what I want you to look at is this information right here, danger of toxicity. So many people have this ideology that more is better, and they don't understand that uh, taking too much of a given supplement can be dangerous. And so over here on the left-hand side of this figure, this is kind of the general accepted view, you know, the, the, this being the RDA. You know, if they think that that's the average amount that a person gets. That's not at all true, um, and that anything above and beyond that is safe. So that's not the case. Um, certainly large amounts of certain nutrients can be dangerous to the body. Now this is what the majority of you all really need to look at closely, nutrient assessment. Because considering that most of the people who take this class are, are planning on being either nurses or in the radiology program or dental hygiene, um, it's, it's important that you, as a clinician, be able to perform an assessment so that you can identify when a person, person is malnourished as well as when a person um, is doing something like um, you know, ingesting, an appropriate, an, an, ingesting an inappropriate amount of simple sugars in their diets. And we live in a society where almost 1 in 10 people is diabetic type 2. And those people do need your guidance. Um, look at the information on, or I guess I should say in, uh, figure 1-8. This does a very good job of illustrating the stages in the development of, um, of a nutrient deficiency. And um, we're looking at from top to bottom what happens in the body and which level of or what method of assessment is needed to identify what's going on in the body. And uh, one thing that I will point out <clears throat> is that um, oftentimes we're going to be dealing with sick people and secondary deficiencies, and sec by the way a secondary deficiency is one that is caused by an illness. A uh, perfect example is what happens with people when they um, if, say for example get cancer or have cancer. Uh, they're they, they're deficient in their nutrients and they their, their health suffers because of that. But make sure you look over that information. Uh, also make sure you look over the information about how chronic diseases affect health. Five of the six leading causes of death have have a relationship with diet or alcohol. Um, I'm going to have to cut it short short there or cut it off here so that I can get under the 15 minute limit here. Uh, thank you for your attention and um, happy studying.